Today we're going to be taking a look at hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, which is a medical emergency that can be seen in some diabetic patients. Before we take a look at the condition itself, it's first important to recap the functions of insulin. So if you remember, when we have high levels of blood glucose, it triggers the pancreas, and more specifically, the beta cells of the pancreas, to start secreting insulin. And this insulin can act in two main ways to reduce blood glucose levels back to normal. The first being increasing glucose uptake. So what happens here is that insulin binds its receptor, and this triggers a transporter called GLUT4 to fuse with the cell surface membrane, thereby allowing glucose to enter the cell via the system. Another mechanism involves increasing glycogenesis, and again, insulin binds its receptor, and glucose is able to enter the cell. But this time, upon entering, the glucose fuses with other glucose molecules to form a long chain of glycogen, and this is useful for glucose storage. Now, what can happen in some cases is that patients may develop insulin resistance, usually due to a high level of blood glucose over time, and this is most commonly associated with type 2 diabetes. So as you can see here, we have the normal process where beta cells are producing insulin. But what can happen is that insulin does not act on the cells as well as it used to. In other words, there's insulin insensitivity or resistance. And as a result of this, there's now going to be less glucose able to enter the cell via the blood. And therefore, there's going to be more glucose in the blood and less glucose in the cells. This entire process repeats and the beta cells try to produce more insulin, resulting in hyperinsulinemia in an attempt to drive glucose into cells. And while this does work up to some extent, eventually there comes a point where the beta cells cannot keep up and blood glucose levels continue to rise. And this is usually the point where we want to initiate treatment to prevent complications of the condition. In cases of severely uncontrolled diabetes, Patients may go on to develop a rare condition known as hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, or HHS, which is most commonly seen in type 2 diabetics. And there can be multiple causes behind this. For example, there could be poor compliance with medications, infections which exacerbate the condition, or it could be the first point of presentation for a patient who did not have a previous diagnosis of diabetes. In terms of the diagnosis itself, we can actually look at the terminology. So hyperosmolar refers to an increased osmolality of greater than 320 milliosmoles per kilogram, coupled with dehydration symptoms. And hyperglycemic refers to values of blood glucose which are above 30 millimoles per liter, which is higher than the cutoff for diabetic ketoacidosis. And another key difference between DKA and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state is that there are no ketones present in the latter, so the values are usually below 3 millimoles per liter, and this can be used to rule out the alternative diagnosis. We can also look at these key investigation findings to work out the signs and symptoms of HHS. So for example, in the case of increased osmolality, patients may develop nausea, dry skin, low blood pressure, and confusion, as well as dehydration symptoms. And just to explain this, what's happening is that because there's a high level of glucose in the blood, water gets dragged out of cells via osmosis. And this results in the cells becoming shriveled and shrunk over time. Now, because there's a high level of water in the blood, this results in the kidneys excreting more urine, in other words, polyurea, which causes excessive fluid loss or dehydration over time. Turning towards the hyperglycemia, patients may develop exacerbated diabetic symptoms, including polyphagia, polydipsia, and polyurea. There are also a few key points to remember, which include that HHS usually develops over days while diabetic ketoacidosis develops within 24 hours, and also that HHS carries a much higher mortality rate compared with DKA, so it's important to recognize and treat the condition as soon as possible. For the management of HHS, it's important to treat the dehydration symptoms first, usually by starting IV fluids such as 0.9% saline to restore the fluid balance of the patient. In terms of the hyperglycemia, patients can be administered a fixed rate IV insulin infusion of 0.05 units per kilogram per hour. And this is slightly less than the rate used for diabetic ketoacidosis. The way that this works is that the IV insulin is enough to drive glucose back into the cells, 
along with some potassium ions as a byproduct. In some cases, the blood potassium levels might decrease too much, so it's important to regularly monitor this and replace with potassium chloride if necessary. Finally, it's important to treat the underlying cause. So for example, in the case of infections, treating this with antibiotics and combining this with VTE prophylaxis to reduce the risk of complications. It's important to aim for a fall of glucose at a rate of around five millimoles per liter per hour and not any higher than this, as this can risk some electrolyte abnormalities. And another target is to aim for a replacement of around 50% of the estimated fluid loss within the first 12 hours as dehydration is the main risk factor in this patient group. And here we have a quick summary slide outlining everything I've gone through in the video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments, and I'll see you in the next video.